Thank you everybody for playing musical chairs. Hi, I am Priyanka Sharma and I am Director of Technical Evangelism at GitLab. Today we are hosting GitLab Connect SF in partnership with General Catalyst Venture Partners. Uh, we're super excited that you're all here. Uh, we're being recorded and this is going to go on the interwebs, just FYI. The theme for today is Zero Trust Security. As many of you know, security is a hot topic, especially in the age of cloud native, which I, trust me, I hear a lot about. I serve on the board of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and uh, it's an important aspect of companies modernizing their software workflows. So today we're gonna have conversations around there that there's folks from multiple companies here today, so everybody should mingle, hang out, learn from each other. Um, and the agenda for today is gonna be, first we'll start with a kickoff talk uh, by Steve Herod, Dr. Steve Herod, who is a general partner at uh, General Catalyst, uh, followed by a lightning talk by Jim Zemlin, who heads the Linux Foundation. And then we'll have a panel with these awesome panelists right here, where we'll talk about zero trust security. After the panel, folks can ask questions, and we'll all interact and uh, talk to each other. Um, if there are things that are discussed on the panel for which you have a comment, that's also welcome. I think of this as an interactive experience and less of a broadcast. So, with all that said, uh, let's get started. Um, I'd like to welcome Steve Herod, who is a GP at General Catalyst and has a background in computer science and was when the CTO of VMware in his early days, among many other accomplishments. You're very nice. <laughs> uh, I just want to say a few things quickly as we welcome the, the panelists here. First of all, thanks for coming to General Catalyst. We're in Palo Alto, if you ever down there. We're in San Francisco and Boston, New York. And I lead our investments in uh, developer tools and, and enterprise infrastructure, kind of anything that's extra techy as well. So it's a, this is a good crowd to be with. Um, I, I guess this is also nice because we're on the eve of RSA. How many people oh, yeah. here are going to RSA? Like, so apologies, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's such a tough event. There, you know, there's 800 plus companies that are gonna be there this year. And part of it is this is one of the biggest growing areas of, um, of trouble, obviously. That's why it's a board level issue. It's also one of the growing budget areas because it is still a problem. Um, but I think it's also really neat, and I think that's what the, the group here will talk about. Really, like, as you're going to try and improve the software development lifecycle, which GitLab is obviously, you know, that is the mission, uh, how can you actually make security, which is usually the biggest inhibitor, actually become part of the flow? And so I'm anxious to hear how you all think about it. Uh, there's usually themes that come at each RSA, if you've ever gone to these. Um, one year, well, it's gone through a bunch of different phases. This year, I think the predictions are, uh, it'll be, everyone will say they're doing AI, so that'll be the first, <laughs> the first prediction. Actually, I heard the, the funny quote now is if it's written in PowerPoint, it's probably AI. If it's written in Python, it's ML. So that's the way to know. Um, so I think AI would be a big deal. Um, zero trust architectures, this group will talk about, is, is absolutely something. It's kind of a trust no one, even if they're in your perimeter. Um, so that'll be a big theme. And then cloud native apps and, and the way that they're deployed, whether it's in containers or in the future as serverless comes on board. Uh, really big focus, and people don't really know yet exactly how the, the security world will work for that. So our friends at Twistlock and other places can talk about that. So anyway, um, the whole point of these events is for you all to talk to each other and meet some interesting people. So I hope you do that, and uh, thanks for coming. All right. Well, thank you so much, Steve. We appreciate your remarks, and it's so nice to be here at General Catalyst. I really appreciate you hosting. Um, now I'd like to welcome Jim Zemlin, Executive Director of the Linux Foundation, which doesn't need any introduction. They, <laughs> they are leading the charge on open source across the world. I, every time I talk to Jim, he's either in one country or another, rarely ever in San Francisco. It's like the mission is going far and wide. And uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is also a part of the Linux Foundation. So they're very deeply involved with modernizing software workflows. So with that, Jim, please come and talk to us about security right. and open source. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, you've all heard of Linux, I know that, but how many po people here know that the Linux Foundation has a lot of projects, including the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, beyond Linux? Were, were people even aware of that? I always try to, Absolutely. all right, this is a good crowd. Like, <laughs> San Francisco, right, a venture firm, GitLab, like, you know. 
Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we started out uh, as the Linux Foundation, but really took a lot of the practices that we learned in collaborative development from Linux. Uh, obviously, Git was another outgrowth from Linus Torvalds, who works at the Foundation, and we are glad to see that there's a lot of commercial value being captured from uh, Git and uh, that uh, project. Um, but, you know, we work on uh, the Kubernetes project, uh, Node.js, Cloud Foundry is a project of the Linux Foundation. Uh, we're the largest certificate authority in the world. Uh, Let's Encrypt is one of our projects. Uh, so we just have a, a very hundreds of open source projects and thousands of developers working on them. A couple of very quick trivia questions, and I'll talk about application security. Um, we gather about 40,000 developers every year at open source events all over the world. Uh, our uh, KubeCon Barcelona is expecting 12,000 people, I think. Oh, yes. Wow. Yes, we're a little freaked out about I'm space. A <laughs> uh, but it just, the, the growth curve of the interest, attendance, and then just quality of the attendees at these events, just in my tenure at the LF, which admittedly has been long, is just stunning to see. And I think it, what it is is a shift uh, in purchasing patterns, influence, uh, towards developers uh, and towards open source that's just manifesting it itself uh, in our experience at the Linux Foundation. And one of the fun things about the Linux Foundation I was talking to Steve about earlier is I get to see all kinds of projects from the world's most successful projects to projects that may be struggling. And that's something I think about application security as it relates to open source that all of us have uh, sort of a collective interest in, uh, and in many cases, a collective responsibility to try and understand. You know, even the, the most successful open source projects, whether it's Linux or Kubernetes, tend to have a very similar set of economics, labor patterns, uh, and sustainability patterns. You start with incredible code, you don't end there, uh, but that code is generally worked on by a, you know, diverse set of stakeholders, whether it's a company or people from different countries or different development perspectives. But the main thing is there's a second step of productization where Git begets a GitLab or a GitHub, a Kubernetes begets a Heptio or a Kubernetes service on any of the popular clouds. And those products in the productization process provide tremendous innovation feedback. You know, what does it mean to scale? Uh, you know, the Alibaba cloud on the most popular shopping day in China. Like, you, you don't get those requirements uh, working from your PC at home. Like, it's a very important innovation feedback loop into the upstream project. In addition, it kicks off a ton of profit. Like, uh, there is a lot of money that's being made either directly, companies based on uh, open source. So, uh, we're proud at the foundation that last year, Two projects based directly on technology started by Linus Torvalds, Git and uh, Linux, were collectively purchased for $40 billion. Now we're waiting for those deals to completely close so we can, you know, get our portion. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's that monetization, it's that value capture that then creates reinvestment back in the open source project. Not in the form of working at the Linux Foundation was, or, or giving to the Linux Foundation, I was joking about that. It's largely the labor economics of the developers who work at a VMware or an Amazon Cloud, you know, wherever it is, that are working back in Kubernetes or Linux and creating more value that begets better products and services, more profit, better code. And that's really how generally the economics work. Uh, and in that cycle, you get the benefit of people who, as they productize, care about security. Uh, and I would argue that even in that very effective positive feedback loop, we can improve in those healthy, sustainable projects application security practices. And that's a big part of what the foundation is focused on right now uh, and what we think will improve our collective uh, privacy and, and security. You know, things like just making sure that there's a responsible disclosure policy, there's a security mailing list, that you uh, have good test coverage. Again, these, for people who are in application security, like a big, this is very basic, and it may shock you that many open source projects, and I'm not gonna name one, <coughs> uh, but not the best test coverage <laughs> in the world. Uh, and you know, we need to kind of continue to work on that. Um, you know, fuzzing the code regularly uh, you know, produces a lot of bugs, but those bugs are important to fix in order to reduce 
uh, the, the, the footprint for uh, being uh, exploited as, as software, which is what kind of a, a lot of intrusions uh, end up uh, coming from. Um, you know, third party audit of very, very critical code bases is something that's really important. Bug bounty programs, I noticed there's a HackerOne t-shirt right there. I don't know if you work <laughs> at HackerOne, but uh, 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 we work with Martin who uh, helps us facilitate bug bounty programs for critical open source projects. Um, you know, making sure that application security is part and parcel, like the, the process, and you know, it's obviously GitLab very, uh, cares very much about this, uh, is something that we really want to promote in the big open source projects that we all care about. And that's something you're going to see us do more and more and more and more. The, the interesting thing is that most big successful open source projects from a security perspective tend to be generally good in, in the same way. That's that positive feedback loop. They have the means and the resources to collectively fund an audit to do meaningful application security practices. The question that I think is even more interesting is what do you do with the long tail of projects that fall in the intersection of important to our security and privacy and totally screwed up beyond belief. This is really the, the most difficult part of uh, understanding all of our collective uh, security from a software perspective because this software is so widely deployed in almost everything we use every single day. And what I'm talking about are not just doing a dependency analysis on the software you're running, which you should, and then doing a vulnerability analysis of that and so forth. That's going to pick up NPM packages. It's going to, you know, things from like the major package management systems, Ruby gems and so forth, where you're pulling in things They maybe the wrong versions are out of date and there's some vulnerabilities because of that and so on and so forth. Like there's a whole industry now of software composition analysis tools and products from companies like GitLab that do that kind of work. But the question that I think is even more interesting is something the Linux Foundation is working with uh, Harvard's Lab for Innovation Science, the Institute for Defense Analysis in Washington and some others on, is trying to answer some simple questions. What is this world's most important software? By package, by version number, by some algorithm that, me that measures criticality. Is it network facing? Is crypto involved? Like where is it on the stack in terms of criticality? Uh, understanding that, ranking that, so you can say, starting with number one and all the way down to, let's say, three, 4,000, here's the world's most important software. Second question, who wrote this stuff? Does anybody know? I know, it's actually kind of disturbing. Like, we don't actually quite know. Uh, I think with modern version control systems like GitLab or GitHub, where fortunately a lot of these projects live, you have relatively good provenance of where code is coming from. Uh, true identity may be a little bit more opaque. I think I'd like to see some things that uh, solve for that in the future. But for older projects that are critical, and everybody knows these names, they're the open SSLs, the NTPDs of the world, it's less clear who's working on it. They're not in places like GitHub. They're in like super old versions of like Bitbucket and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with Bitbucket. Uh, <laughs> but they just are in a mishmash of things. I, I was telling Steve earlier, all the good projects are generally good in the same way, and all the troubled projects are very Tolstoy-esque. They're just screwed up in their own unique individual ways. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you then some examples, and I'll, I'll stop speaking, of the third question that we really ask, which is, you know, so who wrote, who, what is the world's most important software? Who wrote it? And then is it secure? Is, is this helping us? Is this hurting us? And what we've discovered in that long tail of these projects like an OpenSSL or an OpenSSH or an NTPD is there's these unique cast of characters that maintain uh, this software. Uh, you know, uh, OpenSSL is sort of the perennial example where uh, the Linux Foundation post Heartbleed, this is when everybody's privacy was essentially exposed on the internet due to a vulnerability in OpenSSL, uh, raised, I, I raised a $6 billion fund to go help these projects in 48 hours. People were like freaking out, like, oh my God. And I remember talking to people and saying, you know, OpenSSL is maintained by 
Steve Henson and Steve Marquez, these very dedicated individuals who have cryptography experience in a very unique space. Um, it, it, in another way of saying it is the internet is, is secured by two guys named Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you just see like policymakers like, oh my, I knew the open source was bad and I always said it. <laughs> um, Sadly, that's not an exaggeration. I, 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 it's, it's true. And I got more, unfortunately, which I, can't, I won't share tonight. Uh, but, you know, what, what I think is interesting and what I think is a, a call for the industry and for open source projects is akin to uh, something that, um, that, uh, that basically Microsoft did. So this is, you know, now that Microsoft is a great member of the Linux Foundation and we love them so much, I'm now going around talking about everything I've learned from Microsoft. And this is actually something where the open source community can take a, a, some good lessons from Microsoft. And I, and I will say there's a lot of impressive people there. Uh, Bill Gates writes this letter, I think it was 2003, 2004, stop all software production. We're not gonna release any more products. We have a real meaningful security problem here. It is bad, you know, we just, it, and, and customers were, I believe, like even just like, hey, we're not gonna buy anything more, it's that bad, you're just exposing all of our private data, it's just terrible. And uh, he, a, a gentleman named Steve Lipner, who's a, a, a wonderful guy, uh, retired now, but an application security specialist at the time, went and forced every employee at Microsoft that was at least on the technical side, we're gonna look at every line of code, we're gonna take, take uh, application security classes. I don't even know if they called it, maybe secure coding classes they called it at the time. Uh, we are gonna go through and make sure that we have a good way of doing this. We're gonna have bug Tuesdays. They, they literally research like what is the best day to release bug fixes so that people aren't at the end of the month where they're kind of sloughing off and the beginning of the month where they're super busy. Like that day is the day where these patches are gonna get applied. And it was really an effective thing, mainly because if you didn't do that, you were gonna be fired. <laughs> so people kind of wanted their jobs. So the question to all of us, and then, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the panel, is in a, a world where in an open source project, you cannot be fired, where you, know, you lead through influence, where even though all of the developers tend to be professionals in the good projects and maybe in some of the long tail projects, it's, it's still not a thing where I can go to open SSL people or I guess I could say that to Linus, but like probably not, even though I really am his boss and he doesn't listen to me ever, but like <laughs> it's, it's not that kind of world. And so the question is what do we do about it? And, and at the foundation we believe the answer is we have to create a culture of, of application security and of secure coding practices for all of these projects. And we've devised lots of different ways and are still experimenting and still learning and sort of still stumbling along to do this. Uh, we created a, a thing called the Core Infrastructure Initiative Badging Program. So people like to have badges on LinkedIn or GitHub or GitLab or wherever. And so this is something where in order to get the badge you have to show do you have a security mailing list? Do you do responsible disclosure? Do you have at least, not just theater, but like meaningful application security practices in your code? And I think we've done now 2,000 projects have graduated from that. It's a requirement for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation to even get into both the sandbox and graduate. Um, and we do it for all Linux Foundation projects. But we need to kind of bring people with us by creating incentives and this culture. I think there's interesting thing going, things going on, both from software composition analysis uh, vendors. I'll do a quick shout out to a portfolio company, uh, Tidelift, which is uh, of General Catalyst, that's doing some things to try and improve some of the long tail economics around uh, certain open source projects. All of these things, I think, I mean, one's an investment thesis, but in our case, they're all these little experiments that we're doing to get us collectively to a state of solid application security practices for code. Uh, I think zero trust computing could be part of that, literally in the process of how these projects get made. Uh, I, I will never forget a terrifying call I got that kernel.org had been hacked and compromised. Uh, the gentleman who did that has actually gone to prison for it. Uh, we got him, uh, but it was disturbing. Thank God Git was structured in such a way that uh, we could go back and check uh, every patch that was ever committed, ever. 
and rebuild the entire data center from scratch. But just understanding the systems, where the code is developed, who wrote it, why they wrote it, and is it secure, and what projects are important, I think is a really important question. And like any of you who are super smart about technology or all of this, those sound like simple questions, but please help me noodle on them. Because when you literally ask yourself, what is the most important shared software by vertical industry package versioning number, where are you going to get that info? Who's going to give it to you? Is it in production? Is it just stuff they bought? Where is it? It's actually really hard to get. And then when you start getting the provenance and who wrote it, I mean, we're literally, we have tools doing essentially cyber archaeology, trying to figure out who wrote this stuff, who owns what, when it got committed, did they change spacing, did they actually commit that line or not? So these are tough, intractable, difficult problems. I think they'll take years for us to, to figure out. Uh, but the Linux Foundation is committed to it. If you want to get involved, we have our core infrastructure initiative. Uh, all of our projects are engaged in this in two weeks, and this is my shameless plug, and I'll give up the, rant, the my time here, is uh, we're going to have a meeting for all the open source you know, CEOs, leaders of the industry, leaders of projects down in Half Moon Bay, uh, and we're going to be announcing some new initiatives and tools to, to, to solve this very problem. So that's the challenge. I hope, I know HackerOne they we're working with and a whole bunch of others, so I hope you all join in on trying to improve the security and privacy of all of us by improving the quality of software in these open source projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Every time I talk to Jim, it's, I learn so many new things about the history of the internet, the history of open source, the biggest problems we're dealing with. So I'm so glad that he came here and talked to us all today. Um, I'm always inspired after talking to Jim, so I'll take a moment. <laughs> okay. I'm done. <laughs> so um, with that, we'll start with the panel part of today's event. Uh, for the sake of the recording, um, I'll start by introducing myself and then the topic. And then we'll have some intros here and then get into it. Um, as I said before, uh, ideally hold your questions till the end. But if you have a comment on something that's being discussed, you can raise your hand and suggest it. This is a collaborative thing. So I'm Priyanka Sharma, director of uh, technical evangelism at GitLab and also a board member of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And today I'm hosting a panel on zero trust security here. Um, zero trust security, as we learned a little bit from uh, Jim, uh, Jim's talk as well as from uh, Steve's, is it's about building a culture where security is a top concern, where every developer is thinking about it. And there are protections in place the farther in you go. So firewall after firewall after firewall is a simplistic way of saying it. Don't freak out at me, guys. <laughs> and, <laughs> but um, the concept of zero security, uh, zero trust security, is what we're going to um, unify on today with a very diverse panel with different um, security practitioners and um, vendors over here. So with that, let's get started. Um, Andrew, would you want to kick it off? Uh, sure. So, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Andrew. I'm uh, the, the head of product and one of the co-founders of a small company called Cytale. Uh, we're about 24 engineers based out of San Francisco and uh, we focus on a, uh, a particular part of, I guess, the zero trust problem, but a really important one, uh, which is identity of software systems or trust of software systems. How do I get all of my disparate parts of a, of a, of a software system or solution or a distributed application to be able to actually talk to each other and trust that, each, that, uh, that I'm talking to the right person? And uh, we do that in a couple of ways. Uh, the first thing we do is, or that we've been working on, is a, an open source project called, uh, called Spiffy, uh, which is actually now part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, what Spiffy allows you to do is to build, uh, uh, you know, f uh, be uh, build your cloud native applications with best in class uh, app trust and application authentication and, and PKI built in. So it just becomes a, a function of the platform. Uh, and then on top of that, we have some commercial tooling as well that helps. Once you've, once you've established trust across your cloud native application, you usually have to establish trust back to things that are a little less cloud native uh, and uh, be able to authenticate to those. And so we have tools to help with that as well. I love Spiffy. Doing some talks about it. <laughs> it's based on a Google project, right? It is, yes. It's uh, so it's uh, it's the initial inspiration. Uh, actually, the, the the name Spiffy comes from Joe Beta, who is part of the Kubernetes project, and he. Uh, uh, 
he had spent some time at Google. He started Kubernetes to, to take the ideas behind Borg, this internal Google system, and, and see what would happen if we created a, an accessible open source analog of it. Um, and then he went to, uh, he, he uh, cast his mind around for other systems at Google that could service the same treatment. And uh, he came across a tool called LOAS, which is this system at Google uh, that runs on, I think, every, every piece of uh, developer-facing or infrastructure-facing Every, every machine running code at Google runs this software. Um, and it's, uh, it's the foundation, in many ways, of Google security. And uh, his big idea was to say, well, could we, much as we did with Kubernetes and Borg, could we do the same thing with, uh, with LOAS? And so that's really where Spiffy came from. Uh, and now we've got uh, a, lot of other, a lot of other folks uh, you know, not too far from this office, actually, who've been uh, contributing to it as well. So um, Uber have made a lot of contributions recently, Square are very involved with this project, Capital One, and a few other folks. So it's, um, uh, it's taking Google's ideas and bringing them to the rest of us. Awesome. Patrick. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Patrick Townsend. Uh, Townsend Security is the company. I'm founder and CEO. We specialize in protecting data at rest, so encrypting data, and then doing the hardest part of that, which is protecting encryption keys. So in today's world, uh, now, uh, doing encryption is really not hard. Uh, almost all the basic languages have good encrypto libraries. It's just readily available. Protecting encryption keys is really the challenge. And so that's where, uh, that's where we come into play. We have products. Uh, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, you know, uh, unless you've kind of been through this, it's hard to appreciate what Jim was saying. We're so dependent on open source. Uh, it's deeply in uh, our products. We're dependent on it. We contribute to that community. We need that community desperately. The two Steves are people that we've worked with over the years. <laughs> I love it. it. was no exaggeration. Uh, we love them. They're way overworked. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, uh, we as a company, we're typically on, you know, we, we come into play when there's a problem. When someone calls us, they're in trouble. Somehow they forgot to put a certain amount of security in their projects, and now they're suffering from it, and we're going to you know, help. But it's so important to work in uh, security, like encryption and key management, into your whole DevOps process. And so we are GitLab customers. We appreciate that technology. We use a lot of these technologies. But security has to go right in there from the beginning all the way down through. It is so hard to re-engineer these things. And, and I think there's a lot of convergence between zero trust and cloud native. If you're doing cloud native stuff, and we're, we're right in the middle of this ourselves, um, you really have to adopt a zero trust model. Because even if, you're, if your project's going on premise, the architecture is cloud, and your customer wants to get to the cloud, or they think they want to get to the cloud anyway. So you have to adopt the uh, zero trust model even if you don't think initially you might be in the cloud. You're, you have to adopt that. It's where people are going and it's what they want. So um, totally uh, in agreement with the notion of working security in at the beginning. It is so hard to patch that in at the end. And I think actually we've seen companies, startups, as well as mature companies fail uh, in their projects. Maybe not the whole company, sometimes the whole company but uh, fail uh, when they get down to the end and they didn't do the security piece right. And they try to close that big deal. And uh, maybe it's a global bank. And suddenly they get a SIG they've got to fill out with 80 security questions. <laughs> and they can answer maybe two. <laughs> okay, and then they're, then they're not in contention anymore. Then they're not able to compete. So it is important. I'm just so glad that uh, so many companies are focused on this and working it in. And uh, we come at it from security, so we, we're, we're learning our way into the uh, DevOps area. We, we're obviously doing DevOps. But uh, that's our, we're, our learning curve is more uh, in that spot. So anyway, uh, thank you. It was a, uh, yeah, good. It's hard to say anything after Jim spoke, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's where we come from. So I have a question. So the two Steves, let's go back to that. Uh, do they not sleep? What's the deal? Uh, I, I, don't <laughs> think they, I don't think they sleep. <laughs> so Steve Hinson and Steve Marquess, again, uh, are the kind of the core, they're, they're technical people, they're the core people around OpenSSL. OpenSSL yeah. is everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to over, uh, overstate the importance of that open source project. Uh, they helped us do our first FIPS 140-2 validation. There were components that we used at OpenSSL. They were there helping us, you know, step by step and uh, get that done. 
they're, they're just in so many products, it's hard to overstate how important that is. But the, wow. it's just really, I think, I, I think they're probably, I hope there's more infrastructure there today. <laughs> when they got into trouble, I think they piled in, right? Uh, there were a lot of folks who started contributing uh, to help we, with that. We did a big grant. It's not just the Steve's anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's yeah. No, no, that's OK. When we engaged in the first time, there were two Steves. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, Steve Marquez. We couldn't talk to Steve Henson because he, he never stopped working on the code. <laughs> but we were with Steve That's right. No. He might be a mythical creature. I don't know. <laughs> kind of like Satoshi. <laughs> yeah, right. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Blake. I'm with GitLab, and I focus on security. I'm a product marketing, but um, more of the security evangelist and pretty passionate about application security. Um, from a zero trust standpoint, you know, as, as containers and Kubernetes um, kind of detach the application where it can run on any cloud, you know, we are, it, one of our goals is to be cloud agnostic so that you can run your applications anywhere that you choose. And as you do that, it changes the whole security landscape because now you know, there is no perimeter anymore that you're protecting. So that's why zero trust becomes so important and protecting the data through encryption, uh, protecting the applications that process that data. And what we do is we protect the applications in two ways, or secure, secure them in two ways. One is we help you as the customer of GitLab use um, our scanning capabilities to scan your code and the other way is we protect the software development lifecycle, the integrity of that, so that as, as Jim was saying, you want to know who made the change, uh, what, you know, when did they do it, what did they change, um, all of those kind of audit capabilities of the lifecycle. And I've got a whole page on it out there under compliance. If you're interested, you can see um, you know, more details about how GitLab can help with the, the compliance end of things. But on the application security testing side, you know, if you think about it, AppSec's been around for a very long time. What, 15 years or so? That's a long time in security, in the security landscape. Maybe longer. Um, and yet, we only have, uh, you know, probably 20% of the folks out there using application security. And we're still having lots of security hacks um, you know, that focus on the application. So you have to kind of question, I think it was, was it Albert Einstein that said, if you're doing the same thing over uh, and expecting this, you know, don't expect the same, different results, something like that. I need to look up that quote again. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, um, it's really important to think about is there a better way to do application security? And so what GitLab does is we are helping really shift left. And in fact, I'd call it a seismic shift because lots of people are trying to take security tools and applying them to developers. But what we want to do is really enable a whole change in the workflow, a change in how the security people are involved. So empowered the developers to find and fix whatever they can. And then let the security folks be the ones that help with the exceptions. So let them come in and help with what, de what the developers need help with. Um, rather than, you know, I've got 10,000 vulnerabilities and the security person is just, you know, wading through all of those and prioritizing them, get them out of that minutia. Let them focus on, on the value added pieces and so dev can, can um, iteratively, as your DevOps environment is very iterative, your security environment needs to be just as iterative. And so that's a, an area that's very passionate with, we're focused on. Yeah, I work with Cindy and I learned so much from her about security, zero trust security, security and cloud native. So I myself am a DevOps person, right? I have spent a lot of time in observability and uh, hang out around the CNCF folks a lot. Um, but I'm new to security and everything I've learned, I'm like, man, so this is like, you know, if someone hacks into our system, takes all the stuff, it's our fault. <laughs> and so it's like, there's no police around here? Oh my gosh, this is reality. And then I was like, this is why Mr. Robot is this popular. Now I get it. Uh, it's become my go-to show. But I've learned all of that from Cindy and Kathy who leads security at GitLab. And I think 
uh, that thought process adds a lot to the product development. Um, finally, Kevin, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Kevin Lewis. I'm a principal solution architect at Twistlock, and we're a cloud native security company. Um, we started primarily as a container security company, securing things from you know, the entire development life cycle, from the build to the deployment, as well as the runtime. Uh, but over time, we've expanded out to cover pretty much anything that you can provision in the cloud, whether that's virtual machines, containers, you know, your clusters, or even your serverless functions. And what we're seeing, and you, know, you guys have made a lot of great points about you know, zero trust, is that when you start um, you know, building things for the cloud, you can't trust anything. You don't know where the applications are coming from, who's provisioning resources, um, and you have so many different touch points of how you can be compromised. There's not you know, one ingress point anymore. You've got virtual machines that can be compromised that have access to Docker networks. You've got serverless functions that could be exploited that you may not have secured properly that now can access resources. And so you have so many different touch points. And you know, part of that is how do we secure that? And some of that is shifting things more downstream. So you put security closer to the actual applications and the things that you're using rather than traditionally where you have things as far upstream and protecting the perimeter. And so really what we focus on is how do we make that possible? And we feel that you have to integrate first with the development life cycle, which is um, you know, integrating directly into the build process, whether that's with GitLab or Jenkins or Circle or whatever you guys happen to use to build better images, build better applications, and let the developers know up front, you have vulnerabilities, you have things that you can fix. So shift security left, you know, tighten the feedback loop with them so you're fixing things before they ever even make it out of the build process. So that's kind of step one, how do you build more secure images and, and, and more secure resources? Second part is monitoring over time, scanning things like registries and your serverless repositories and understanding, are there new vulnerabilities that affect me today that weren't there during the build? Um, I don't want to have to wait until I scan things over time or you know, scan things in production to understand that I have new vulnerabilities. So let's take a continuous approach where we scan and understand vulnerabilities on a daily basis send alerts to the right people so they can be fixed and you can push out new versions. And then finally in the runtime, really understanding the intent of applications, uh, you know, which process, network, file system activities that we expect our resources and entities to exhibit and then alert and enforce on any of the anomalies in those behaviors. So really having that end-to-end -end protection and understanding you know, how can we empower developers but also empower the security professionals to be able to interject policies in an automated fashion. So developers aren't left to be responsible for the security of the applications. You can have other parties involved as well. Yeah, when I was first looking at cloud computing and cloud native way back, I realized how many exposed edges there are and how no one knows what's going on there. And I was like, how did the cloud providers convince anyone to use what they're <laughs> offering? This is crazy. This is, as I said, there's no police, right? right. And um, I realized, and, and Cindy and I have talked about this, how the business value of shipping fast, of be, using microservices, of going cloud native is so high that people have been willing to make that uh, trade-off. And what that means is that security then becomes just that much more important. And so all of these different approaches and different aspects are so critical to like, make more and more secure for the world as it moves cloud native. So I want to ask a question around zero trust that may be different for each of you. I rather expect it to be different for each of you. So all of, uh, all of the people on the panel here are taking one angle or another. There's a lot of overlap, but uh, different approaches, encryption, tokens, scanning, et cetera. Um, what aspect of building the zero trust security mindset or culture do you see as most important and least addressed in your customers. You don't have to take names, but I'd love to hear some anecdotes around that. Maybe we start with you? Yeah, sure. Well, I think there's a really um, uh, area that I think throws most customers off, mm -hmm. and that is going to the cloud. So the cloud service providers are all messaging constantly about security. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you read it, and they, they're constantly talking about how secure their platforms are. And they are, uh, I, I think we're partners with uh, all the major platforms, and so there's some really great security people there. They go about this far, okay, and then they're really secure. Now you take your stuff into the cloud, you have to own that piece of it. 
And I think this is a, really throws a lot of people on the ground, and, and it's hard to get a, 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 your arms around. And, and partly it's uh, you know the messaging about the cloud mm -hmm. service providers that, that they're doing. So most of uh, when we engage, uh, and we're in uh, AWS and Azure, and uh, you know we have been for quite some time. But uh, what we see is that people are not owning the zero t mm. trust requirement with solutions they're taking in there. So I, you know, I know that uh, you know Microsoft and Amazon are securing their data centers. They do SOC two, SOC three. They're security. They're they're serious about all that stuff, and they have good teams. But when you lay your stuff on top of that, you have to own that zero trust stuff, and that is throwing most people on the ground. And, and I think. Uh, uh, is probably the thing that we see most frequently lacking, in, and especially in a world where everybody is trying to get to the cloud. Right. You know? So it's like too much trust. They're starting with too much trust. <laughs> they're, they're, they're trusting the platform too much. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's not the fault of the platform. I mean, I'm not trying to cast shade on uh, Amazon or, uh, or Microsoft or Google or anybody else. It's just that when you build on top of that platform, that's your, that's your foundation. And they own that. They just don't. They, you just have to own your part. Right. And that you can't make assumptions about that, even even to the fact that you're using the platform correctly. Yeah. So we've seen breaches around Amazon's uh, S3 service, for example. That's you know, it, it just if you don't use the service correctly, you can get yourself it's in your own trouble. Fault. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it sounds it. so harsh when I say it. I'm sorry. <laughs> your own <Yeah>. fault. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Um, what do I use in me? Well, kind of going off of what yeah. Patrick says, the, um, there's a lot of effort that still has to be done. The cloud vendors make it sound like if you're using cloud, you're safe. I mean, similarly, people tend to think, oh, I'm using containers or microservices, so I'm more safe because my things are more partitioned. And yes, there's a benefit to that, but there's a downside of it too because now, you know, for containers, you've got your image, um, your, image your registry. Um, your your traffic within the container and all of those things need to be secured as well. So um, they become they become an additional point that wasn't of entry that wasn't there, and um, so people need to look at the cloud native environment a little bit more holistically. I think and and you know we've had a hard time getting them to look at application security. Now we need to get them to look at not only the application itself but the infrastructure in which it resides and operates. And, and so I think that's going to be the challenge going forward. I hear that. Um, what about you, Kevin? Yeah, I think similar. Um, I, th I think there's two kinds of things. I think number one, kind of focusing on containers and the serverless functions is that mm, so we give yes. a lot of um, the responsibility to the developers to secure their applications. Right. And you know, most developers don't necessarily have that security background. So I'm building an application, I'm building an image, I might even build a database image that's supposed to have encryption, and I may not have any experience in that. And now I've deployed it into the cloud. It has customer data or you know, business data in it that can be easily exploited. Um, so I think you know, giving a lot of trust to the developers to secure their own images is one thing that needs more focus. And then kind of going on what you guys have said is that ability for anybody to deploy anything in the cloud, I mean, so many people have access to the AWS accounts. I can deploy something in production, just provision an EC2 instance and leave it there, and right. do we even know that it's there, right? <laughs> and so now it has access to our VPCs, it has access to our data, right. and it might just sit there not being updated, not anybody even knowing it's there until it's too late. Right. And so I think that, number one, the developers have the responsibility of security, and so there's ways and tools that we can help make that easier but also understanding what's out there, what's being secured, and then having policies and, and controls in place to ensure that we know what's being deployed into the cloud. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think just to kind of carry on the theme that, that, that every other panelist said, it's that, that you know, there's this gap between, uh, you know, on the one hand, there's application developers who are pushing to, to build in the cloud and build on containers and build on functions and, 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 and get that agility, get their things to market. Um, but don't necessarily uh, spend too much time thinking about security. Um, but then you have security teams who, of course, it's, it's their day job to think about security. But the, the toolbox that they have and the mental models even that security teams have are you know, geared around things like perimeters and around firewalls and IP addresses. And, uh, you know, the, uh, and it, it's, it's hard. There's a, it, it becomes very difficult 
for organizations to realize the benefits of, of moving to these great new technologies if they, uh, if they apply many of the old security models. You know, there's, the, there's, there's so many cases that uh, you can deploy an application in 20 seconds now, but it still takes you two weeks to get a, you know, a firewall rule set up so that you can actually do it. So um, there's, a, there's, there's a gap between, I guess, what, uh, what, what the application developers who can deploy, who, 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 who want agility and, and, and want to be able to push for that, um, and, uh, and, and these old models of security, and there's, there's not a lot sitting in the middle right now. There's not a toolbox. Um, there's, there aren't design practices, there aren't well-codified design practices um, and, and patterns that people can lean on or even a language that people can right. lean on in order to solve for that. So, I, you know, I think part of that comes down to automation mm. because um, if, if you can automate, you, know, you said uh, having the developers be responsible for security and they don't really understand security. They weren't trained in it necessarily. Um, but if you can automate and find vulnerabilities and um, by looking at, for instance, the, if there's a vulnerable code library that you're using and, you, and the tool can find that there's a more current one, um, apply that as a patch and see if it works. You can run the, run the uh, pipeline if it works. Great, then the answer is to your developer, we found a vulnerability and it's fixed. Instead of, hey, here's a vulnerability and you need to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> yeah. I just would uh, affirm what everybody else has said. You know, we get, uh, at our company, we get up thinking about security every day. Right. That's where we live. The startups that we work with, the companies that we work with, they're trying to bring a solution to market. That might be a financial system or HR. You know, they're trying to compete in their world. Their focus is there. They're trying to get a solution out and make their company right. successful. They're not thinking about security. And so I'm, I'm with you. The more that gets embedded in our DevOps process, in the core modules, mm -hmm. the better off we are. So uh, it would be great if there was, uh, we could enforce that, those different components of security through DevOps. And so something comes out the other end, yes. much more secure. And you don't have to think about it. Right. That's, that's the Best I case. Think, yeah, we all have too much to do, way too much to do. <laughs> and I think that's a real opportunity as well for um, you know, leveraging automation to have your security professionals, they can implement policies in place that as you move through the life cycle, whether it's in the build or even, you know, at deployment time, you can have policies that are built by people who understand what they're trying to accomplish and then let your, you know, your, your DevOps people or your, or your developers deploy applications through those automated pipelines. Now you have security built in. They're still getting feedback on the reason maybe why something wasn't deployed. Maybe you had a critical vulnerability that has a patch available. So let's block the deployment of it. So they get the feedback, but they aren't necessarily responsible for defining those policies. And that's where you can really leverage automation in addition to all the stuff we get from scalability and force multiplier. So I want to ask my last question and then I'll open it up to the audience. So you're all providing some help around security, but you're also running your own systems. So you're consumers of um, security products, of thinking through the zero trust uh, security mo model and all of that. So, and I would imagine you're m much more sophisticated than the average uh, company out there. Um, as folks think about security, there are so many aspects, right? Like the diversity of what you all offer is an example of that. What kind of framework would you should suggest people to use when they're thinking through, okay, this is a good way to get a lot of coverage and feel secure uh, based on your own experience and your own products? It's funny, when we, when we talk about security frameworks, there's a, 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 a whole language and ecosystem there that I, I, I think uh, I'm probably the least qualified person on the panel to talk about, so, so, so I won't. Uh, but there's, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of thinking around you know, practices and policies you can apply. Um, I think in startups, it's even you, know, you, you get exposed to that one way or the other when you start to talk to real customers and all of a sudden you get that 80 page checklist and that security <laughs> and it's, you know, yeah. I don't know, no matter how prepared you are, it's usually a little bit eye opening in some ways. But, uh, yeah. um, uh, but then I think, you know, the, uh, so we, we, you know, we as a company went through that recently and um, the, you know, there's, there's, there's always eye opening and eye opening questions and gotchas, but where we, there, there were also cases where we were looking through those questions and we were, we were breathing a sigh of relief. And it wasn't because we thought of the question specifically, it was because we, uh, we, we were able to put in place some automation and some, to, you know, to, to, to Kevin and Cindy's point, um, some automation such that it almost became a non-issue. Um, and there was, uh, the, the tooling 
the tooling would answer the question for us. Um, and so, uh, uh, which is a somewhat vague answer, but um, the more you can lean on automation, the more a lot of those security questionnaires or NIST questionnaires or uh, you know, FedRAM questionnaires suddenly become um, hopefully a, a bit more tractable. So that means look at a security questionnaire that's part of an RFP or something, mm -hmm. and then automate to checklist and uh, ch answer those checklists, even though you might not be participating in an RFP. It's a good framework to use. It's a, it definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm just trying to, to work, problem yeah. solve here. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. Um, what about you, Cindy? Yeah, oh, sorry, Patrick. You're. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, what Andrew said is uh, right to the point. The automation is uh, critically important. We do have some good frameworks. Uh, Center for Internet Security provides a framework. Uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, provides frameworks. Um, so uh, SANS Institute uh, does a lot of work in this uh, area. Uh, we live in a key management area, so it's a very a narrow part of security, but NIST has provided a framework, an actual published framework for key management systems. People can use that to evaluate uh, potential acquisitions. But the problem is, all that was built without DevOps in mind. That's exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> so, is it cloud so, native friendly? <laughs> it's not. Yeah. So there are the, all the ideas. Of how do you stitch all that into a DevOps process? Right. And the automation and what Cindy was saying, but you know, really, really making this a part of your standard practice and automate it. You don't have to think about it. That we're just not there yet. We're so early days. It needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, OWASP is taking baby steps towards the, the whole DevSecOps thing, but um, it is very early, although I'm sure we'll hear lots of DevSecOps next week at, at RSA. Maybe that'll be the second highest term behind machine learning. <laughs> um, it's there, yeah. Yeah. Um, a shot every time they say DevSecOps. <laughs> right, right. It's a very interesting. <laughs> yeah, drinking game. Yeah. Um, you know, I think... There's some, there are some exciting things coming out. Our CISO, um, Kathy Wang, she's um, really a thought leader around um, Zero Trust. And she's working not only on Zero Trust for GitLab itself, um, but working with the analyst community as well. And, and we're excited that there's, I don't know if I can say who it is, but they're getting ready to do a really cool um, reference architecture around oh, Zero that's Trust. It's cool. both a, an open source version. So what could I put together? for zero trust if I have no money to spend and it's all free and then a paid version and um, you know how would that look and what would it cost me and, and what would That's it give me? Super useful I imagine. What do you guys think? Will it be useful? Yeah. Okay. This is good news. <laughs> yeah, I think the frameworks that you can leverage really depends on what you're trying to secure. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at securing a container versus securing a virtual machine or even setting up policies into your pipeline. I, I think there's different things you can use. The CIS, the Center for Internet Security is fantastic. They have their Docker, their Kubernetes, their Linux benchmarks that you can use. Um, one of the things that we actually do to make that easier on you is we have all those modeled out of the box, nice. but we also rank them based on, we have an in-house research team that ranks them just like we do vulnerabilities. And so you can focus on the critical and high aspects and things that really matter Whereas maybe the things that are ranked as medium and low are things that would be nice to have and you should get to, but it, it really helps you focus if you're new to this environment or you don't have a huge team. These are the things you really should be doing. But let I me mean, kind of get back to the root of the question is it really depends on what you're trying to secure. Um, but definitely start with the CIS benchmarks and then understanding how to integrate security, I think primarily into each phase of the pipeline, whether that's build, deployment, or even runtime. Mm -hmm. Um, having something in each one of those three phases is a good high level to say, okay, let's find something to secure our running stuff. Let's find something to ensure we're monitoring things over time and then, you know, primarily building, you know, better applications out of the build. Got it. Well, thank you. With that, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Anyone have a question? Did anyone hear? Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yes. I'll repeat the question once you've asked it for the benefit of the recording. Sure, thank you for your contribution. I really appreciate this forum, this panel. Um, my application actually spans both cloud and hardware platforms. And I was curious whether you have um, any experience or approaches to mitigating um, insecure processors, firmware, <coughs> and um, whether you see some uh, opportunities to automate pipelines for validating these. Uh, Purism, for instance, is open sourced. Uh, their chipset design. 
uh, pipeline. I was curious to know whether um, anyone has applied, you know, sort of SecOps approach, that SecOps approach is there. Do I have to repeat this question? <laughs> okay. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay, who wants to take that? Well, we intersect. I mean, we have a hardware appliance, and so we're, okay, we follow that. Uh, we understand the Intel uh, SDX challenge uh, and other challenges that have to do with firmware as well as hardware. So these issues come up. We track them uh, very carefully. Um, it's, you, you've touched on a brand new area. I mean, this is uh, getting DevOps to integrate at the hardware level is, uh, is really a challenge. And uh, I'm not, I, maybe you guys have done this, but it's, a, it's an issue, yeah. Yeah, we're not, we're not looking at that um, per se. I can tell you, like, um, a lot of that's being handled at the firmware level. So HP, for instance, is doing a, um, they have a, a new method that'll track whether the firmware itself has changed and whether it's uh, fingerprinted back to its original. Um, so I tend to think of that as more of a hardware piece, but maybe we should talk. Maybe there's a way, you know, maybe there's a gap there that's not being filled. It feels like uh, there's, there's, a, you know, to, there's a set of disjoint technologies right now. There's things like t you know, secure enclaves and, and measured boots and, uh, uh, and then software supply chains and, you know, uh, uh, you know, signed binaries, and then there's things like TLS. So we have all of these different ways of, of verifying um, what goes into and out of our systems and uh, whether or not those systems have been tampered with. But what we don't seem to have right now is a way of being able to reconcile all of that or, or uh, 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 unify all of that in some way. Yeah. Uh, it's not something we're looking at either, but it's, uh, it is something that people are using the Spiffy project to try and solve for. So. Someone look at this. <laughs> someone here, someone, someone else someone. look at this. <laughs> well, actually, you know, I, I, had a, I had a conversation with someone recently, and they, uh, and uh, it was about zero trust, and, mm. and I, I asked them what zero trust meant to them, and they said, you know, this was a, it was a large financial institution, and you know, they took a very, very traditional view of security, uh, which was if it's not behind a locked cage, and I know exactly the names of the people who own the keys to that cage, and I, I you know, I've, I've vetted them, um, then I don't trust it, uh, and that was the, that was. Uh, uh, that, that was that was one model of trust, and um, this person pointed to you know this was in a conference room, and there was a, a server at the back of the room. Uh, it was it was unsecured, you know, it was just an, it wasn't doing anything useful. And they pointed to that server, and they said, to me, zero trust is being able to run the same things that I have in my you know locked data center, where I have to go through biometric screening and all the rest of it, and uh, you know jails and cages to get in. Um, that I can run something on that server with the same degree of integrity and, and, and safety that I could run something in my data center. Um, and their point was that, uh, again, all of the technology is there to do that if we want to. Um, uh, there's, but it's, it's fractured. There's different pieces of it. It's, uh, um, it is things like secure measured boot. It is things like TPMs. Um, and some of these things work better than others, frankly. All of these things, of course, have their own threat models. SGX is a great example. Um, uh, but uh, they, um, uh, they, they can be unified. They can be scored. There's got to be a way to do it, um, but no one really has yet. Someone, yeah, someone should. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Yes. So there's a. Speak loudly so I don't have to repeat. <laughs> Sorry. There's a notion out there of a zero day threat or a zero day uh, vulnerability, uh, something that is, is, is unknown in, in the wild yet. From a security uh, practitioner's standpoint, how often are people um, really worried about those unknown kind of things, or are they focused on the blocking and tackling basic kind of um, uh, types of, of, of you know, um, securing your, your application? And, and how much, how many attacks out there are based off of these zero day threats, or just you know kind of base level, baseline types of uh, you know security protection? All the big ones are zero days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know that what, what a zero day means is it hasn't been um, it hasn't been documented, and it and so people don't know how to patch it. There's not a patch available for it yet, and lots of times those um, are discovered, and they may be they may be disclosed um, ethically, and and that goes back to the vendors for them to create a patch, but sometimes it can be months and months before a patch is released. And so um, your de defense in depth is really important. 
and you know, continuous security scanning everything all the time um, is important and patch management. You want to make sure that when those patches come out, I forget which, there was a big, uh, a real big attack, I forget which one it was, where there had been a patch out for some time and they just didn't ap apply it. Um, and struts, that was well, that, that happens all the time too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was Equifax and the, yeah. the struts right, and right. that thing. Yeah, I think well, the, the... No, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think the, the zero days Defending against that is, so we call that an unknown attack. So there's the known attacks and the unknown attacks, the vulnerabilities, things that, you know, publicly disclosed, I know whether or not, you know, Ubuntu has a patch for it or not. Um, and those are things that we can go ahead and, and fix. When we start talking about the zero days, in that case, um, having policies and things in place that can help prevent those things from happening in the first place is something that we focus on. And so. Like if we take the, the container breakout, the run C vulnerability that's been going around lately for containers, uh, you know, we can't necessarily stop that exploit from, from, from happening, somebody taking advantage of that and running that image if you don't have security in place. But you can put policies in place that say, I'm gonna whitelist the images and resources I'm gonna allow to run. I'm gonna prevent containers from sharing the host namespace. I'm gonna prevent root and privilege containers from running. So there's things that you can put into place to help mitigate some of the zero day things. Um, also one of the things you know, we do is we have our whitelist security modeling where we know which process should be running inside the container, which networking activity or file system activity to expect. Now, the result of the exploit is gonna be something. I'm gonna download an attack kit. I'm going to contact some other server to do whatever. You know? And so there's gonna be fallout from the actual exploit. So how do we protect that fallout and prevent that is a way you can protect against the zero days whereas a known exploit, hopefully there's a patch against it. So there's different ways to protect against them. And I would just add to what Cindy said, um, the, the uh, DevOps environment is critically important. We were affected by Heartbleed, okay? We got a product, it's got OpenSSL in it, you know, Heartbleed happens, Amazon's on the phone, did you, you know, we know that you're running a, <laughs> an exposed version of uh, OpenSSL. How do they know that? Well, okay, they know that. They know everything. Um, but uh, your ability to react depends on your, you know, the automation and the and the uh, DevOps uh, platform that you have. So if you're if you you can identify that and you can get a patch, but can you move it through your whole process? And He's a GitLab is, customer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's true, um, but it's it's critically important that you have those kind of things uh, it, it, that you're doing those kind of things to even to even address the uh, the, uh, the 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 zero day. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. Oh, sorry. Were you going to say something? Oh, um, well, nothing important, but it's <laughs> nothing, um, just just a small observation. You know that an indir another indirect way of, of of helping to solve for that problem uh, is. I guess you're seeing more and more uh, particularly critical security functionality being moved out of applications and into the infrastructure and becoming the provenance of the infrastructure. So, so service mesh is probably a great example of this design pattern, right, where things like OpenSSL now aren't typically run as part of my deployed application binary that an application developer needs to reason about. It's, it's part of a, it's still a binary, but it's now one that's run by my infrastructure team. Um, and so I am at least now in a position to start doing, you know, have a, a single owner of that who can be hopefully responsible for it. And I can start to do, you know, uh, when, I, when, when I find a vulnerability like Heartbleed, I can address it reasonably easily systematically rather than having to go to, you know, a hundred different application development teams and beg and convince them to update the patch uh, and to, to, to rebuild it. This is, of course, assuming there is a patch, so it's a bit more than zero day, but at least gets you to a point where you can, um, uh, when, when you do have a fix for something, you have an option to do so. That's a great point. And I think there's a trend now to embed security invisibly into the product. Okay, take it out of the hands of the, of the end user, the end customer who may not have an IT team even in-house, having trouble getting, uh, you know, uh, uh, cycles from their, their security team embedded in the application. So I think um, uh, our partners who've embedded our technology uh, have benefited from doing that because they can address it, they can, it's just immediately there, and they don't have the uh, complexity. It simplifies right. in many respects that, and that just makes it faster to address too. That, yeah, that's, a, great that's a big parallel to the observability world, right? Where a lot of folks are putting in 
the observability stuff into the service mesh or uh, whatever they use to generate uh, the, the base framework of each microservice just so that there's something that out of the box people have and it makes it just a lot more easier. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, with that, we're 10 minutes to eight o'clock, so I'd like to give a hand of applause for the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We all, I learned a lot. I think the audience did too. They stuck around this sign for something. <laughs> and I'd like to just thank all of you for coming. Um, this event was brought to you by General Cat Catalyst and GitLab, the first single application for the entire DevSecOps lifecycle. Thank you so much for coming.